Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from today. My name is Julia Ann Love, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. I am a partner and the practice group leader for the Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Practice of Thompson Hine. I am joined today by Thompson Hine Associate Mark Kroboth from our Cleveland office and Austin Chelko, a colleague from the Chelko Consulting Group. Today, Mark, Austin, and I will examine the Consolidated Appropriation Act's new plan transparency requirements, including prescription drug reporting, the prohibition on gag clauses, ID card disclosures, provider directory requirements, and continuity of care requirements. This is the fourth or six Thompson Hine webinars presented the fourth Wednesday of every month at noon through August. Each webinar will explore a different Consolidated Appropriations Act related topic, including mental health parity, transparency, surprise billing, and more. Please join us monthly or just for the topics of interest to you. You can register through the invitation you received or on the events tab on the Thompson Hine website. To proactively address a question we, fre we frequently receive, today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent to all registrants within approximately two business days. During today's presentation, please feel free to use the question box in the control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar as time permits. And now we will begin today's program. As I mentioned, today's presentation will cover several group health plan transparency requirements under the Consolidated Appropriations Act. To start us off, Mark and Austin will discuss prescription drug reporting requirements, and then Austin and I will turn to the prohibition on gag clauses, the requirement for group health plans to implement a self-service price comparison tool, ID card disclosure requirements, provider directory requirements, and continuity of care requirements. Thank you, Julia. <clears throat> So before getting into the meat of the prescription drug reporting requirements, I just wanted to step back um, and, and you know, talk about where this came from. So section 204 division BB of the Consolidated Appropriations Act amended the Internal Revenue Code, ERISA and the Public Health Service Act to include certain uh, reporting requirements for group health plans and other health plan issuers. And as we'll discuss, a majority of the reporting requirements that were enacted through this section were prescription drug related um, with the thinking that transparency and pricing will uh, will do will reduce waste and allow individuals and group health plans to make better informed decisions surrounding prescription drug care and, and coverage so the information that is to be reported generally will fall into one of two categories um, the first being information that can be cannot be aggregated, and second being information that can be aggregated. Uh, unfortunately, for group health plan sponsors, most of the information um, will be unavailable to them. Therefore, it's important that they will be uh, to reach out to your vendors, you know, your PBMs or TPAs, to rely on them uh, in assisting you with uh, complying with the requirements. So moving on to information that cannot be aggregated. So the report requires um, several different pieces of information and the information that cannot be aggregated is generally plan specific information. So information on the plan, um, the issuers and the reporting entities, uh, the beginning and end dates of the plan year um, that are uh, and on or before the end of the reference year. And here the reference year is the calendar year. And so the reporting will be done on a calendar year basis, even though you might have a plan that is a non-calendar year or off-calendar year plan. You also have to report the number of participants, beneficiaries, or enrollees covered on the last day of the reference year in each state in which a plan or coverage is offered. And predominantly, as a group health plan, you're going to have this information, whether you have it readily available or, or it's, it's attainable for you. Um, it, it should be information that is relatively easy to, to uh, obtain for purposes of these reporting. The information that can be aggregated is the information that will most likely reside with your PBMs or your TPAs. 
And so what I mean when I say aggregated is that these reporting entities, whoever the entity is that, that ultimately reports on the group health plan's behalf, um, is gonna be able to compile information into a single report based on a few different criteria that I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but before getting into each category, essentially there are three main categories of information that are to be reported. It's these top 50 lists that um, discuss various uh, information on uh, prescription drug utilization under the plan, uh, group health plan spending information, and then prescription drug rebate information. So the first two bullets up there, um, or the first two categories are the 50 most frequently dispensed brand name drugs and the 50 costliest drugs by annual spending. And for each of these categories, you must include the total amount spent by the plan, the total amount spent by enrollees, the number of enrollees which had a claim for any of these 50 drugs, the total dosage units dispensed of each of these drugs, and the total number of paid claims. Uh, the next category is the 50 drugs by spending increase in dollar amount. And that's that's gonna be two different pieces of information. One is the year before the reporting year and then the year of the reporting year. So there's gonna be a comparison of the two years. And that the information, the sub information that uh, will be reported in those groups is the same as the, you know, the first two. Uh, top 50 lists, which include annual plan spending by the plan, annual spending by the enrollees, um, number of enrollees with a paid claim, uh, usage information or dosage information, and the number of total paid so claims. So can I ask you a question, Mark? Sure. So if this is data that can be aggregated, meaning it can be aggregated along like the PBM's book of business, right? how do they identify it for each specific plan within that book of business? Well, they're likely they're likely not going to be able to if they aggregate the data all together. Um, they, so, so it's not really on a plan by plan basis then? It's not going to be on a plan by plan basis. Gotcha. Um, you're, there is gonna be information, like I said on, the, on the, the first slide that the plan will have to enter or, or someone will have to enter on behalf of the plan that um, provides plan specific information. But once the information is reported by, let's just say a PBM, it's gonna be aggregated and and not, it won't reflect that any information on the single plan. Thank you, that's helpful. So the, the fourth group of information is the total annual healthcare spending by the plan, which uh, needs to be broken down into hospital costs, primary care costs, specialty care costs, prescription drug costs, and other medical costs, such as uh, wellness services. And Here's where we start getting into information that a PBM might not have. So there's going to have to be some communication between the group health plan. Um, if you have a, a PBM, you might have a, a separate TPA who's who will have this information. And um, it, it's very important to, to communicate and have an open line of communication so that every entity that has their piece of information um, can come together and, and get this information filed. Um, as needed. You're also gonna to have to report premium spending information, including the average monthly premium paid by the employer, the average monthly premium paid by enrollees, uh, the total number of life years of participants and beneficiaries during the reporting period, and the total amount of the premium. And then sort of the last category is, has to do with rebates. You're gonna to have to report rebates, fees, and other remuneration, including uh, total annual reporting of fees and rebates, uh, the difference between what the plan pays PBMs and what PBMs then pay pharmacies, and uh, a summary of the bona fide services paid by a manufacturer to a PBM. You're also going to have to report prescription drug rebates um, among two different classes. First is uh, ther by therapeutic class, and second is the top 25 prescription drugs with the highest rebates. And these uh, there are subcategories uh, for, for each of these. Um, you're going to have to provide the annual plan spend, annual enrollee spend, dosage units, dispense, et cetera, the same information that you have to report for the top 50 groups. But you also need to report information on rebates that are passed through to the plan. 
uh, rebates that enrollees receive at the point of sale, and then rebates that are retained by the PBMs. So once again, the information is gonna to have to come from various different sources, whether it's PBMs, group health plans, or, or other vendors. And then lastly, you're going to need to report the impact of any rebates on premiums and cost sharing. So the aggregation process that I uh, mentioned earlier um, is, is a very important step here. So back in November, there was an interim final rule that was released and it provided some information on the process for reporting. Um, and really, it's all we have to go with at the moment. I would expect that there would be more guidance coming out between now and when the first report is due, um, but we will talk about that more a little bit later. So separate reports must be submitted for each state and for each market segment which coverage was provided. So when we say market segment here, there are essentially seven total market segments. And they include the individual market, which uh, does not count the student market. There's a separate, separate market segment for the student market, uh, fully insured small group market. And for purpose of small group definition, it's any group that has 100 or less employees, uh, fully insured large group market, self-insured small group, self-insured large group, and federal employees health benefits program. So it's likely that a group health plan will only fall into one of these categories, and obviously some uh, group health plans can't be, uh, but it is also possible that a group health plan could fall into both. Um, you know, you might have self-insured coverage somewhere and, and fully insured coverage elsewhere if you have, you know, if you have a, a large company just based on uh, demographics and location, you might have a fully insured product somewhere. So you're going to have at least two different sets of all the information that I talked about on the previous slide. Um, aggregation by state is permissible. So for an entity with a fully insured policy, uh, information must be included, included in the report for the state in which the insurance contract uh, was issued. For self-insured policies, you'll look to the state where the plan sponsor has its principal place of business. And then if you have coverage through a group trust or, or a MIWA, you sh uh, the information should be reported where the employer or the association has its principal place of business. Hey, Mark, uh, we did get one question uh, related to the plan-specific information that cannot be aggregated is yeah. does the reporting require us to report it separately for each coverage option like a ppo and high deductible health plan i know i think we we found that with some of the other requirements yeah um i i don't think that's specifically provided in the guidance um i would have to go back to look to make sure but i don't think that is necessary yeah i don't think it is either i think it says the plan but it doesn't go back in in deeper detail and say like the coverage option like we saw for machine readable files. So that may be a question that's answered in future guidance. Got it, thank you. Sure. So one other thing that I just wanted to mention here is uh, that the, the Consolidated Appropriation Act obligates the various departments to provide a report to Congress on a biannual basis regarding the information that has been reported to them. And it seems like as a result of this, through um, what they released in the final, the interim final rule, it seems like uh, aggregation is preferred by the departments. Um, and, and so to the extent you can aggregate, um, I think that would be a better option. Um, it'd probably be less, less work in the long run as well. And obviously it's, it's clearly what the departments are looking for. So due dates. So when the Consolidated Appropriations Act was originally signed into legislation back at the end of 2020, um, the first report was due on December 27th, 2021. That has obviously passed. We, in August of last year, implementation FAQ 49 was released and it extended the due dates. So currently uh, information for the years 2020 and 2021 are now due on December 27th, 2022 and subsequent reports will be due on June 1st of the year following the reporting year. Um, and, you know, I, I've been hearing talk that maybe this will be extended further. As of right now, it hasn't. 
that's certainly possible. Um, like I said earlier, I think it's definitely possible that we receive other guidance between now and December 27th um, to assist entities with you know, their reporting obligations. I want to take back what I just said. I'm looking at the implementation FAQs 49, and it does reference in some places the plan and in other places the plan or coverage. So I think that answer is unclear. But I had originally thought it was based on the plan and not on the coverage options. So I don't know where I got that from. Yeah, no, but I agree. I hadn't seen anything to, discussing separate coverage options. Okay, so assistance with reporting. I think this is this is going to be very crucial. As I mentioned earlier, group health plans are just not in a position to provide this information on their own. Um, I think it's going to be important uh, to to lean on your vendors, and it's also important to remember that the obligation is on the group group health plan itself, rather than TPAs or PBMs to do the reporting. Um, even though those entities are the ones with ultimately with the information. As I mentioned earlier, unlike uh, the machine readable files, if anyone joined us last month, we discussed the machine readable file requirement, which just a quick plug uh, goes into effect next Friday, July 1st for if you have a calendar year plan. So hopefully everyone's on top of that. Um, but here you will be able to aggregate data, um, which, is, which is a nice trade-off. For fully insured plans, you should consider entering into a written agreement with your insurer that obligates them to provide the required information, um, and it will absolve any liability if you do that and they fail to do so or they provide the incorrect information. I think for self-insured plans, you should still definitely consider entering into written agreements um, or amending existing agreements. Uh, to provide, you know, the scope of services that your TPA or PBM will be providing um, when it comes to complying with this reporting requirement. Uh, one of the downsides to the aggregation is that group health plans are not going to be able to use the information uh, on a plan level basis because it's it's likely not going to be provided to them. Um, I guess I, I don't know for sure, but my intuition would be that PBMs are not going to parse out individual plan information once they've aggregated it. Um, so I think that this, I think that goes back to what the, this information is really being used for. And I think it's, it's, it's aimed at helping everyone in a, in a grander scale and providing a report to Congress to uh, dis, you know, disclose healthcare pricing or prescription drug, drug pricing overall. Um, rather than on, on a plan level basis. Another consideration for group health plans is whether the vendor will be submitting plan specific data on behalf of the plan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, your PBM is probably not going to have the exact information that uh, is required. So for example, at the end of the plan year, they might not know exactly how many covered lives are in, you know, in the plan. So they might lean on you if you are a group health plan to help them provide that information. Let's see. So, you know, I think it's really important to be having discussions with your vendors. Um, to come to an agreement on what they can provide and, and what they can't provide. Um, we've seen information from various large PBMs. Some of them are unwilling to take any of the information a group health plan might have and aggregate it. Uh, some of them are willing to accept information from the group health plan that um, they, that they themselves don't have. For example, if you are, you need to report, one of the reporting items is the prescription drugs, the total amount of prescription drugs utilization. So the PBM is going to obviously have a lot of that information, but let's say somebody goes to the hospital and they receive 
uh, you know, a drug is dispensed to an individual. PBM is not going to have that information. So they're going to have to, that information that ultimately reaches the report is going to have to be supplemented either by a TDA, another outside vendor, or, the, you know, the group health plan itself. Another issue is with carve-out vendors. Uh, group health plans are going to have to work with their carve-out vendors and their TBAs and any other vendors they may have. You know, various entities might have various information that is required to be reported um, under this new law. I think it remains to be seen how well all these entities will work together to compile reports, but I think that's definitely a question that should be asked, I know, as early on in the process as possible. Um, and with reporting due in roughly six months, I think you know now is a, a good time to be asking those questions. Another issue that could come up is switching vendors. So let's say, for example, you have a PBM and they're your PBM for all of 2023. Uh, uh, January of 2024, you switch PBMs, you go with somebody else, everything works out well, but then June comes along and now you have to report this information. Um, obviously, your new PBM is going to have the information from the 2023 year. You're going to have to reach out to your old provider um, and, and see if they're gonna provide that information on your behalf. One good piece of information that I think would be important is to make sure that you have in any sort of services agreement that they will be assisting with the reporting for any years for which they were providing services to the plan. Um, and then, then in that case, they will be obligated to you know, assist with reporting for the 2023 plan year. Unfortunately, there's no good faith compliance rule in the uh, interim final rule. You know, a lot of these rules, we see a, a good faith compliance, such as, you know, in the machine readable files, there's various provisions. If you do this, we'll take it as a good faith compliance of the rules. Uh, there's nothing here right now. Uh, obviously, that could change as, you know, hopefully new guidance comes out. But as of right now, that's something worth noting. And then neither the Consolidated Appropriations Act or the Interim Final Rule discuss penalties. So it's likely that any regulators would look to existing enforcement rules for any penalties that might be associated with non-compliance, you know, such as the typical uh, per day penalties that already exist. So which plans are exempt? Unfortunately for group health plans, most plans are going to be subject to these reporting requirements, including uh, grandfathered plans and any uh, you know in individuals covered through associations. There are a few exempt plans uh, which uh, mainly deal with non-prescription drug plans such as you know uh, dental and vision plans. Uh, Short-term limited duration plans and HRAs will be exempt. Retiree-only plans are also exempt, um, but most of the other plans that are exempt are governmental-type plans such as uh, state children's health insurance programs or Medicare Part D. Um, so that's pretty much that for me. For now, I'm going to toss it over to Austin, who's going to talk to some of the practical implications of this rule. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And maybe one more question before I kind of kick that off. Do you know uh, the implications if you're if a health plan is reporting for a retiree drug subsidy? You know, if they're a retiree only plan. Yeah, I that's not something I considered. I don't know if you have. That might not have been addressed yet. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you. So, um, if you want to flip to the next slide, I think the big question here that that comes about for employers, obviously. Each employer on this call has a different PBM, different PBM arrangement. Sometimes they might have two PBMs in place. Sometimes there might be a PBM for traditional drugs and one for specialty drugs. And the big question is, do you have contractual agreement that they'll report this on your behalf? I think that we've seen even a few emails come out from the big three in the last couple of days about employers needing to opt in to the program if they want uh, the PBM to report on their behalf. Uh, in most situations, it, it seems to make sense for employers to do that. Uh, I believe that we've seen some PBMs that are interested in charging for these services, 
uh, others that you know plan to do it um, for free or as you know as part of their their current uh, scope of services. And then the bigger question, probably you know even beyond that, you know just making sure that they're going to file it on your behalf is finding out what information that they need from you uh, in order to support those efforts because. This is not going to be just kind of a, where they run a report and submit it on your behalf. There is going to be another of other items. And, you know, for example, one of the big three said, we're not going to load new data into our system regularly uh, from you. You know, additional fields, you know, that, you, that they might receive on an eligibility file today. But there is going to be supplemental information that they need in order to aggregate that reporting. And, uh, those deadlines for confirming that information are coming up very quick, uh, July and August um, for some of the ones that we've seen. So just kind of practically for employers, I think getting ahead of this now, uh, identifying, you know, just confirming that they're going to do it for you and then identifying what information they need from you and making sure that you can provide that information timely to them uh, are gonna be the two big short-term uh, topics that, you know, that you'll wanna cover. Yeah, and I'll just add, it, it, it's also important for the plan sponsor and the uh, plan fiduciaries to know what the PBM is not going to do for them. So like Mark said, there are certain uh, non-aggregated information relating to the plan specifically that some PBMs may include in their reporting and some may not. And how are you going to uh, complete that reporting on your own uh, behalf? And then like Mark said too, the you know carve out vendors or uh, hospital services that include prescription drugs or whatever that need to be aggregated with the aggregated data, how do you get that data to the PBM and will they even take it or do you have to do a supplemental report? I think there's a lot of open questions relating to the uh, prescription drug reporting and we're hopeful that additional guidance will be issued before the end of the year that will help uh, plan sponsors in completing this reporting. Um, but if not, I think we're we're all kind of uh, left to our own devices as to how we're going to accomplish this. So with that, we'll move on to um, the prohibition on gag clauses. Um, this provision of the Consolidated Appropriations Act was immediately effective on the effective date of enactment, which was December 27, 2020 and basically provides that group health plans cannot enter into agreements that would directly or indirectly restrict the plan from providing provider-specific cost or quality of care data to referring providers, the plan sponsor, participants, beneficiaries, or enrollees, or electronically accessing de-identified claims and encounter data for each participant, beneficiary, or enrollee. And by this, they mean um, claim-related financial information that, that's set forth in a provider contract provider information, service codes, and any other data that would be included in a claim or encounter file. And also the group, uh, the uh, agreement cannot prohibit the plan from sharing the information with business associates. I think it's interesting that the language of the statute says they, that group health plans cannot enter into agreements. That seems to suggest that this only applies to new agreements, but I think that's still somewhat unclear. Um, and I think that plan sponsors are well served in reviewing their existing agreements to see if these, um, if the agreements have language prohibiting uh, the disclosure of, of financial information um, and maybe addressing that as you're addressing the agreements or amending the agreements for other um, changes as a result of the Consolidated Appropriations Act or the Transparency and Coverage Regulations. So this prohibition on gang clauses um, applies to any contract with healthcare providers, networks, or associations of providers. It also applies to third party, third party administrators and other service providers that are offering a network of providers. And as I mentioned, I think you know, plan sponsors should be reviewing their existing agreements for gag clauses and updating the, the language in the agreements as changes are made for other things relating to the agreements. Um, and the other thing that I want to note is that uh, in discussing uh, services agreements with third party administrators and others on behalf of our clients, we're seeing a lot of pushback on this prohibition on gag clauses and some of the kind of middle ground language that's being proposed would provide that the uh, TPA or whomever would uh, disclose the financial information only subject to a non-disclosure agreement. And I kind of scratch my head and think if we can't enter into a new agreement that prevents 
you know, the plan from disclosing uh, financial information to, um, you know, business associates or others, uh, including the um, participants, then how can we require a non-disclosure agreement that does just that? So I think that's something to look out for. And I just feel I would be remiss if when we're discussing services agreements, uh, I didn't also remind everyone of a topic that we also covered at our last uh, webinar, and that is the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act requirement relating to uh, fee disclosures for service providers that are providing consulting services or brokerage services. So if you're amending um, any existing services agreement, you know, you want to be think about whether the amendment to the agreement or the existing agreement creates a, a fee disclosure requirement. And like Mark said, uh, many of the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act requirements require cooperation and input from the group health plan service providers. So, you know, it's really important that you're in your ongoing discussions with your service providers that you're discussing these uh, additional services to be provided relating to the Consolidated Appropriations Act and understand what obligations there are that the service provider is undertaking and what obligations you know, are still on the plan or the plan fiduciaries to undertake and making sure that the, um, the services agreement reflects the services that the service provider is to be providing and also reflects the fees that they're going to be charging, if any, for those services and also that the indemnification provisions of the services agreement address any failure on behalf of the service provider to help the plan and the fiduciary satisfy their requirements. Turning back to the prohibition on gag clauses, um, the CAA also requires that plans annually report to the tri-agencies an attestation that the plan is in compliance. Um, that we, we expect future guidance on how the attestations are to be provided um, but no other guidance is anticipated. And finally, the implementation FAQ that Mark referenced earlier provides that plans should implement a reasonable good faith interpretation of the statute. Next, we're going to discuss the requirements for plans to provide a self-service price comparison tool. Uh, you may recall that prior to the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the tri-agencies issued the Transparency and Coverage Regulations. Those regulations require plans to establish a tool effective January 1st, 2023, which allows participants to get advanced explanations of benefits, providing advanced estimates and expected costs, and the ability to compare costs and provider options. The information has to be available via the internet or in paper, form upon request. And the transparency and coverage rules require that the first uh, disclosure be available effective January 1st, 2023 for 500 specific items and services. And then effective January 1st, 2024, the plan disclosure is required for all items and covered items and services under the plan. But in the category of nothing is ever easy, the Consolidated Appropriations Act also requires plans to provide a price comparison tool. Under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the tool is required to allow participants to compare the amount of cost sharing that would apply for a specific item or service from, from participating providers in a geographic region. And this tool must be available via the internet or via the telephone. The original timing of the price comparison tool under the Consolidated Appropriations Act was for plan years beginning on or after January 1st, 2022, but our uh, FAQ Part 49 uh, extended that uh, enforcement deadline until January 1st, 2023. And in doing so, they also addressed the fact that the uh, transparency and coverage regulations would only have required the disclosure via the internet or uh, in paper upon request. So they added to that requirement that the, uh, that the disclosure be made via the internet, via the telephone, or in paper upon request. And as I also mentioned, they ex extended the deadline. So the original deadline for the Consolidated Appropriations Act tool was January 1st, 2022. But because of the kind of overlap of the requirements in the um, 
Transparency and Coverage Regulations and the Consolidated Appropriations Act, they extended that effective date till January 1st, 2023. Yeah, thanks, Julie. And just, uh, again, wanted to just kind of prompt a few considerations for employers to think about. You know, this reminds me a little bit of when, you know, the hourly tracking rules came through uh, with, you know, full-time, part-time status. Uh, a few years ago, as well as, you know, when 1095s uh, became a requirement and um, really just additional reporting requirements from employers that didn't exist before. And I think a big question then was, you know, who's going to provide the, you know, the tool and who's going to pay for the tool and how will we pay for it? And then, you know, are there going to be some of these third party vendors kind of coming to the scene, trying to um, solve this issue for employers and will those potentially be uh, an alternative for employers if they're trying to get something in place quickly. I, I remember uh, I think one of the big vendors at the hourly tracking rules was Tango Health uh, was one of the first kind of on the scene to help solve that problem and I anticipate that um, this is going to be a contentious point for uh, TPAs and PBMs uh, as we get into the early stages of next year to just identify, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make it so that it's, you know, uh, the information that's required and how are we going to pay for it? Obviously, there's a number of health plan tools that exist today, um, you know, where you can get price estimates, but this will obviously take that to another level. So, um, you know, I think more to come over the next uh, couple months, uh, more, um, of an administrative burden for plan uh, for plans to, to deal with and uh, something that you'll want to keep on the radar with your vendors to make sure that you've got a plan in place to, to meet the deadlines. Yeah, and I also think that the more complex your plan is, the more difficult it is to be to going to be to satisfy this requirement because of the coordination amongst the various vendors. So I know of group health plans that have, you know, multiple different coverage options with multiple different carve out vendors and then also you know different PBMs depending on which uh, coverage option you select under the plan so again this is going to take significant coordination in order to pull it off by January 1st 2023 so certainly encourage uh, plan sponsors to be thinking about this now moving on to ID cards this is probably something everyone has already addressed so hopefully this is just a reminder for you and you can take a breather from the prescription drug reporting and the price transparency tools this is a lot easier to satisfy so the requirement is essentially that for plan years beginning on or after January 1st 2022 health plans must include additional information on ID cards for their group health plan coverage and the additional information includes the deductible amounts, the out-of-pocket amounts, and telephone numbers and websites that are uh, available for basically in-network hospitals or providers. And like many of the other requirements under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, no regulations are anticipated, but future sub-regulatory guidance is expected. Um, I can't imagine what they what else they need to tell us about ID cards, but I think the regulators like to issue guidance that's easy and non-controversial. So it looks like they're doing something as opposed to getting out guidance on the more difficult topics like the prescription drug reporting or the price transparency tool. Regardless, um, as with other requirements that we've discussed, the implementation FAQs provide that plan uh, sponsors can use a reasonable good faith interpretation of the uh, statute in order to comply and that ID cards should be reasonably designed to provide information to all plan participants. Um, I read that to mean that for those of us uh, who are of a certain age that need cheaters in order to read the information on the card, that the font be of a big enough size that we can read them. And I think it also means that the various pieces of information need to be easily identifiable on the, the ID cards. Mark is laughing because he's not of that age. <laughs> Hopefully one day. <laughs> So the next uh, compliance topic that we're going to talk about is the uh, requirement to provide access to provider directories. This requirement was also effective earlier this year on January 1st, 2022, and provides that group health plans must establish a process to verify provider directory information at least every 90 days. 
and establish a protocol for responding to participant requests regarding whether a provider is a covered provider. Uh, plans are also required to host a database of participating providers on a public website and include a disclaimer on paper copies of provider directories. Um, I assume the public website would be uh, the, the plan uh, TPA's website, but remember when we talked about the machine readable files, it was required to be on a public website of the plan, which caused a lot of plan sponsors, I think, to uh, think about if they don't have a uh, public website of the plan, they put the machine readable files on the uh, you know, website of the company. In this case, it doesn't seem like it would be a good place for it to be on the website of the company. And maybe if your um, provider directories only need to be available to people who are um, active employees or currently enrolled in the plan through COBRA, that having it on the website of the third party administrator is probably okay because everyone can access that if they're either eligible to participate in the plan or um, you know, a, somebody who's participating in the plan like a COBRA beneficiary or a spouse or other dependent. And then disclaimer on the provider directories, basically I think is intended to provide that, you know, it's effective as of a specific date and it could be changed, you know, at any time and how to access where the updated information would be. There are some significant consequences if the access to the provider directory requirements are not satisfied. So if a provider directory is inaccurate or not timely updated, the plan can only require participants to pay the cost sharing amounts that are uh, applicable to in-network services. And the plan must apply the, uh, the cost sharing amounts that the participant pays to in-network cost sharing deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums. Um, so I think, you know, I mentioned that it could be significant consequences. So if you think about it, if the plan can only charge the participant the cost sharing amount that applies to the um, in-network services, the out-of-network provider or the, the provider that the participant thought was in-network but turns out to be out-of-network may not be happy with the, <laughs> the cost sharing amount that the, the plan participant provides and may not be subject to the network agreement that would limit the amount that the plan would have to then provide. So, in that case, ordinarily, we'd have balanced billing, and who's going to pay the balanced billing in that case? More than likely, I think it's going to be the plan. So this just underscores the importance of uh, including the third-party administrator's obligations in the services agreement and ensuring that the indemnification provisions cover the plan in the event that the TPA fails to satisfy the, the disclosure requirements. And like most of the other requirements that we've discussed, the implementation FAQs require an, a reasonable good faith interpretation of the rules. But in this case, they've told us that they expect to issue future guidance via regulations. And again, I'll make the comment that <laughs> they're promising guidance here. How hard is it you know, to provide guidance with regard to um, provider directories when we really want guidance on other topics? But maybe that's just an editorial comment for today. Yeah, I think this one's interesting, Julia, because I think most of us kind of expected that they were keeping their directories updated. And I think a big question is, you know, do you know how frequently your administrators are updating their directories today? I think some tend to do it in real time. Others tend to do it probably quarterly. Some maybe do it uh, on an annual basis. But, uh, you know, to your point, I think we want to make sure we're requiring that administrators will commit to updating their directories every 90 days. Uh, at a minimum, and if not, doing it real time. But um, you know, this this I think we've really seen an effort by the administration to avoid any type of balance billing on members if you know they did it on accident. And I think that in many respects, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, on the flip side of that is it will likely become more expensive for employers, as you mentioned. If there's a balance bill that's hanging out there and the employers are, are flip, you know, are, are fronting the bill for that. So um, from, from my perspective for an employer requirement, I would just encourage each employer to make sure that their administrators are uh, complying and committing to update them every 90 days. Right. And I think the other thing is um, another important thing is establishing a protocol for responding to participant requests whether uh, a provider is a covered provider. And I've seen some commentary relating to telephone requests. And so 
um, the suggestion was, you know, is the third party administrator required to send some sort of written communication about the network status of a provider if the participant calls on the telephone? I don't know the answer to that, and maybe that's something to be addressed in the services agreement. Mm -hmm. The last uh, topic for today is the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act requirements relating to continuity of care. This requirement is essentially that while a plan participant is a continuing care patient, the plan must notify the plan participant about the termination and the right to elect continued trans transitional care, so the termination of the, the network providers in network status. And if the plan participant elects to continue the transitional care, the plan must continue to treat the services as in-network for 90 days, and the provider must continue to accept the negotiated in-network payment rate. However, if the termination of the network provider's network contract is due to a failure to meet quality standards or due to fraud, the plan does not need to provide the continuity of care requirements. And for this purpose, a continuing care patient is a plan participant who's undergoing treatment for a serious or complex condition, receiving inpatient care, scheduled to undergo non-elective surgery, someone who's pregnant or someone who's terminally ill. And I think one question um, Austin and I talked about before the webinar started was, um, you know, who has the obligation to notify plan participants? And I, again, I think it, it's going to fall down to what does your service contract say? Is it the service provider's obligation to notify the plan participants when there's been a change? Or is it the, you know, plan fiduciary's responsibility to notify participants if there's been a change? And I think about Austin and I were talking about two different situations. What if, you know, just in the middle of the year, a provider uh, ceases to be a provider? And I, I hear about this. Uh, some of my clients have, uh, you know, hospital systems in their network, I think in the Atlanta area or the Dallas area or whatever, and the, the hospital system will get into a tizzy with the, the TPA and they're going to, we're not going to renew the agreement because we can't come to terms on pricing. And so you have a number of impacted participants during the plan year. Who's going to notify those participants? Who's going to identify who they are and who's going to notify them? Um, and then the other situation is where the uh, plan changes who their third-party administrator is. So, you know, you end one plan year with one service provider and somebody's in the middle of a course of treatment. You know, they're pregnant, they're terminally ill, they have a serious health condition. And the you're entering into an agreement with a new provider that has different network arrangements, so certain of the providers will cease to be a network provider. So just something to think about as you're communicating with your third-party administrators and determining who has um, the obligations here. Yeah, and particularly if you're going to be switching you know, from one TPA to another, is it going to be the burden of the health plan to notify the member, the incumbent TPA, or the upcoming TPA? And you know, really just making sure you have a process in place for communicating with that member. Um, will it be, you know, via email? Will you be doing it um, by doing phone outreach? Will you be doing uh, mail outreach uh, to notify them? And then who's going to be responsible for kind of coordinating, tracking that uh, continuity of care provision? So uh, this is something that um, I think we consider as we make, you know, changes from one TPA to another, but obviously this, um, kind of ramps up the requirements and broadens uh, the requirements a little bit as well. So something that, you know, employers should definitely consider throughout the year if there is a provider change, but uh, also probably, a, a, you know, more impact if you're going to be making a change from one uh, TPA or health plan to another. Thanks, Austin. So that uh, brings us to the end of our prepared remarks for today. Um, I just want to remind you of the next webinar is on July 27th, and it will cover surprise billing. And then our final webinar in the series is on August 24th, and we'll cover lessons learned and Q&A. And we are just now uh, pulling up the questions that we received during today's webinar, and I'm going to do my best to read them, and we will try to answer them. 
So we have a few comments from our expert in the field, Kim. Mark, can you read what those say? I can't read them. Rx reporting for plan. For plan specific information that cannot be aggregated. Will the report require us to report separately for each coverage option? So that was the, the question. And then there was some commentary. Uh, states that these provisions are applicable to group health plans and group health insurance issuers offering coverage, offering group or individual health insurance coverage. Plan or coverage refers to a uh, group health plan or health insurance coverage. And then as a result, uh, it doesn't seem to mean coverage option. Right, which is what we thought, that yeah. it applies to the plan as a whole and not to each individual coverage option. I can't read what that says. <laughs> there was one other that asked for a follow-up kind of on the question that I asked you, Mark, related to uh, retiree-only plans, uh, whether or not they're they're listed as exempt. I was just doing some research while you were looking um, or while you were speaking, and I couldn't find anything for retiree-only plans specifically, any guidance for retiree-only plans specifically. So hopefully there will be some some clarity in the FAQs that come out about the retiree-only plans because we think well. We think retiree only plans are um, not subject to the prescription drug reporting requirements. Correct, but yeah. But, but we don't know how that correlates with the uh, if you have medic. What was the retiree drug subsidy? Yeah, the reti Medicare retiree drug subsidy. Right. So I guess that's something that we'll continue to watch. Mm -hmm. I, you know. One one huge thing that, that just keeps coming up in my mind is how are plans going to coordinate the various pieces of data for the prescription drug reporting? And the, um, you know, the guidance seems to suggest that the regulators are really looking for plans to not duplicate information. Um, and so, of course, it's very important that, um, you know, if the PBM is going to report on the plan sponsor's behalf, that the plan sponsor not also report the same information. But some of the information I think is going to overlap. And you may possibly end up with, you know, places where you've duplicated inadvertently. Um, and I think just also just gathering the, the various parts and pieces of information is going to be difficult. And, and I think similarly, you know, on the price, price, uh, price comparison tool, you know, coordinating the very various pieces of information so that plan members can easily access the information is going to be difficult um, and, and may, you know, ultimately, as Austin suggested, result in having, um, you know, third parties put together services while they'll, where they'll cultivate the information, you know, and put it together in a, uh, a user-friendly file, you know, or easily friendly, you know, interface, but, you know, at what cost? I think that that's going to be expensive to put mm -hmm. that together and to engage a third party to do that. Agreed. Looks like we have another question. In your opinion, will provider directory verification requirements necessitate a positive confirmation of provider contact information, or would no news is confirmation work when we verify their information? I'm not sure what I mean by no news. I think you need to, if somebody calls and requests information as to whether the an you know a provider is covered or not, I think that there needs to be a positive confirmation that the provider is covered. I, I don't think that the plan can take the position that they don't have to respond to an inquiry because they're um, because they are covered. I, I don't know if that addresses the question or not. Any other questions? Mark, Austin, do you have some questions? I don't think so. I'm in good shape. Thank you both. All right, well, thank you everyone for attending. I think I had closing remarks I'm supposed to cover. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you to Austin and Mark for presenting today and to all of you attending our webinar. As mentioned earlier, we will send today's recorded webinar and slides to all registrants. I hope you can attend one or more of the upcoming CAA webinars. If you have questions we were unable to cover today, please reach out to your Thompson Hine attorney. If you aren't currently a client, please contact me and we will discuss available options to address your needs. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.